So I think we have to be careful about any argument that says these people are crazy, it's never going to happen. You know, there have been lots of claims in the past. The technologies that we live with on a day-to-day -day basis aren't going to be possible. They seem to be possible. We should always be skeptical in order that we aren't taken in by hype and overstatement. Skepticism is likewise important to be able to distinguish between claims about what might happen and claims about what will happen. They now have these automated, like, avatar characters. When he said this, quote, the choice for mankind lies between freedom and happiness, and for the great bulk of mankind, happiness is better. Let's see what's going on. Yes, it's creepy as It feels like pretty invasive to me, I don't know, like where is my sense of privacy now? More than ever before, our privacy is a huge concern. Somebody's watching you all the time and, and it's a little scary. Anyone downloading Snapchat's new Snap Maps option can be tracked. The new Snap Map shows your exact location in real time. I talked to another mother yesterday. They had no idea that this was even a possibility. No clue. All kinds of new features go into those updates that you're not aware of unless you're really re researching everything. Saying that this is dangerous, where will the line for privacy be drawn? This day and age, sadly to say, we have to watch our backs a little bit more often, so the, the feeling that someone might know where you are that you didn't want to know, it can be alarming. Like, that's not something that I would want on my phone. We're bringing the physical world into the virtual world with these types of features. What is this world really about that we are creating? What is the role for human beings in this world we're shaping? Is it just to make our lives easier? Well, in fact, this is a really important point that Aldous Huxley made in his classic dystopian novel, Brave New World. Huxley basically argued a similar point. He argued that Orwell was wrong and that, in fact, people would lose their freedom because they were so entertained by screens, by entertainment, uh, by pop culture, that they would voluntarily give up a lot of their personal information. One thing that I want to start with is that you know, our children are very unique generations. So they're first generation who are born and raised in this hyper-connected internet world. The telephone took 75 long years to acquire 50 million users. The internet, four years. Facebook, 2.5 years. WhatsApp, 15 months, and Angry Birds, 15 days. Yes, you better believe it. Pricing is going futuristic. Some companies are using computer-driven artificial intelligence. Going from a world where people used to stamp the price on the product itself to a world where you're buying goods and services online or even offline but a pricing algorithm now determines it because AI in my opinion is really about to blossom and explode we could liken it maybe to the uh, going back to when electricity came about it changed not just the fact that we could turn a light on but it really changed everybody's lives across the globe that same possibility can happen here with AI very powerful. So it's really a, one of the broadest theses or technologies that we've seen in a long time and a lot of things have had to come together to make that possible. And what's next? Uh, sorry, Something. Matt, we're running out of time, so I hate to jump in. Yeah. We need to fear it. Mark Andreessen said, hey, don't worry about autonomous cars. Kind of laughed it off. We've always been worried about job loss due to technology. It's never happened. It never will. But is this time different because machines are thinking, not just doing? You know, you, you never know what's going to happen in transitions like this. It's about unlimited access and power. In fact, one of the quotes that I found interesting is, if you want to keep a secret, you must also hide it from yourself. I mean, think about it. These companies know you better than you know yourself, and they also understand how to manipulate that knowledge. So the first category is doing. I've learned when you talk at a, you know, this is Texas Tech, right? I mean, so it, they only take you seriously at technical places if you have a laser pointer. So I got myself a laser pointer, and I will use it quite superfluously. AI as robots move from just mechanical devices to devices that can really simulate uh, human behavior. But it's so much 
broader than that. Humanity itself will be changed with this super intelligence and we are at the doorstep of that era. The other way to look at it of course is that this time around it is about our minds and our brains and uh, there's something more mystical going on and, and so forth. Two airlines are testing new technology that could change airport security in the future. The new face of flying and it's yours at Logan Airport. Some passengers no longer need a boarding pass. Instead they can simply use their face. Yeah, the government says it will make us a little safer. Next, please. It looks like science fiction, a machine that scans your face so you can board an airplane without showing any documentation. Well, because I don't need to know everything about us. It's just kind of weird. <laughs> it's the same kind of feeling with location services on phones, how it's like they're always following you. It's kind of like the same thing. Some airlines are quickly moving forward with a plan for facial recognition. Yeah, yeah pretty fast. Some fear it's moving too fast. Implementation of the use of biometrics need to be scrutinized very closely. Now, this isn't about being a Luddite. This is about losing the kind of freedom that we obviously take for granted because unlike the NSA and government agencies, that uh, we're actually inviting these companies to spy on us. So when you travel and you go to the airport and you go through customs, they take note of where you're traveling. It's on their computer systems. They know exactly. They're not supposed to give that information out to anybody. No. Clearly not. But what troubles me is, is something different troubles me is why. Why are they so interested in the travel plans of those particular individuals? There are downsides and risks with every medium of communication and you know television was no different and radio was no different and print was no different. It's just the speed and the scale and the ease of access and the, the, the affordability of the digital revolution that's making it seem like a quantum leap. It's getting to be close to eight billion of us on this planet and we do have a moral obligation to make sure the, the technologies we put in place serve the interests of humanity as a whole. What has changed is a constellation of so-called converging technologies and an ever-accelerating rate of technological change seem poised to give reality to what was once pure speculation. cutting-edge technology is immensely appealing and seductive on the one hand. If people don't understand how to think about what constitutes a good human life, then what will be left to them is this, right? Which again is immensely seductive. So speed is mind-boggling. What I'm particularly concerned about, it is how little the world is prepared for the fourth industrial revolution. Technology disruption, the fourth industrial revolution. Boy, if only I had a penny every time I came across these buzz phrases. Whether you believe that this is a brand new, distinct industrial revolution, or you feel that it's a mere prolongation of the previous one. I think we can all agree here that this phenomenon is all about exponential speed. Um, at the same time, um, education which encourages the kind of moral reflection that I am uh, calling for uh, is increasingly becoming a rare commodity. Education so far in the Arab world has been to stress creating clones of our students. Youth who are identical to each other, who say the same thing when they're asked a question, who answer the same way, who think exactly the same way. And this is part of our paternalistic culture, but part of the third and the second and the first industrial revolution. That the, the fourth revolution does not need that. It needs individuals. This is not what we are teaching. So I think that the problem is that these two trends together you know, the, the, it's, a, it's a vector that points in a very dangerous direction.
And it's not just um, in intelligence, it's, it's in uh, biotechnology. They now have these automated like avatar characters that are going to be uh, counseling and providing therapy for uh, elderly citizens, uh, people going through surgeries, everything. There's a lot of technology that is turning towards avatars or robots to do things in, in replace of humans. My own sense is that the AI technology is not falling from the skies. It is not being delivered in some holy water coming from, from some mountain. It is uh, being built by us. It is being written by people like us. And uh, therefore, it is yet another one of our creations. And uh, I think it is important to keep that in perspective. It is incredibly powerful. The not-so-cynical answer to your question is that we are at this remarkable moment when some things that people might have dreamt about for a very long time now were actually beginning to piece together how it is that some of them might really be brought about by serious human efforts. In this regard, genetic engineering is just the thin edge of the wedge. Fast forward to 2017 and we have 20 human trials. Um, I was interested to read in, a, uh, in the Washington Post earlier this month that a, a Gallup survey of public opinion found that the number of uh, Americans that found um, human cloning was on a par with polygamy, growing upwards and upwards, so from a small base, entering the co public consciousness. What this kind of progress would really look like. But from the broader transhumanist perspective, it is certainly difficult to imagine that somehow in a world of perpetual change, there'll be a moral, fixed moral core to preserve as the wildest of innovations are being developed. And, um, and the desire to improve human health is the first one. And then aging. What are you going to do about making us live forever? <laughs> but those who advance transhumanist goals and expectations are adamant that they simply start from extrapolations of developments that are already in the works or on the horizon. Creating the entrepreneurship mindset through critical thinking is the way of education. It's not reading, it's not changing curriculum. It's to ask any question and get away with it. There is no red lines. There is nothing there. You can ask any question which comes to your mind, including is God there or not? Even that simple question, you have the right to ask it, whatever the answer is. So the people have to be allowed to get that through. To sensible people, this goal of transforming the descendants of present-day humanity into an alien species will sound like science fiction, even a kind of science fiction that can hardly be taken seriously because it develops out of the view that is already so alienated from our humanity. We file taxes, vote in national elections. Why? Why do we do those things? Because there's a persistent need for order in hierarchies, as opposed to a world where we can each of us do as we please. Do as we please. Do as we please. And, and what is the logical conclusion of this? Are we ever going to be able to draw a line in the sand? We are the most powerful generation that's ever existed in human history. In your talk, in the very end, of course, it's a very positive future uh, shared here, which is humans being enhanced by um, all the different technologies hybrided or blended together. To overcome the legacy that nature has bequeathed us by the chance-driven mechanisms of evolution. If we just leave people free to make their own choices about research and development, they believe the new world will 
arise. The world has changed. We can never ever go back to yesterday.